aerodynamic principles. Okay. Uh, let me do this. Okay. And four forces of flight. Kind of a simple thing, right? But anybody know what they are? <laughs> there they are. Okay. It's going to take all of your money. Guarantee that. You guys do know what the proper response is to uh, this question. I'll ask the question, and that is, what makes airplanes fly? Yes, sir. Hmm? What makes airplanes fly? Trust. Wrong. Fleet. Nope. <laughs> makes nope. Dreams. Nope. Money. There it is. <laughs> That's more money. what makes airplanes fly. <laughs> so believe me when I tell you. All right. I'm telling you for real. You get an exam. I don't think Nielsen does this too much. You get in an exam. I don't care if you're going for your ATP, uh, whatever, your type rating check ride on the 777, whatever. You sit there with the inspector, and the inspector says, okay, Captain, what makes an airplane fly? You don't say money, you're wrong. <laughs> you gotta say money, that's what makes them fly. Okay, anyways, these are the real ones. Lift, weight, thrust, and drag. Fantastic, okay? Uh, there's something to be said about unaccelerated flight. So park that for a moment and let me get through lift, thrust, uh, drag, and weight, and all this other stuff. And we got this drag thing. I got an interesting little thing over there as well. So, lit, by the way, this is the same picture. I just put over a little, you know, new, well, you guys see it's the same picture. I just put over the, the real things. So, lift and weight, these are opposing normally. I say normally with a real grain of salt. Because I can change every other vector. You guys okay if I say the word vector? Mm -hmm. Everybody okay? Yeah. So direction and magnitude? Well, until I get with my Latin class and I say vector and we don't know. Oh. I, I'm appreciating more and more of the Russian class. And, and over the past couple years, this has been fun. But I got to learn each one, you know, what are we doing? So vector is fine. So uh, which one of these four vectors can I not change? the direction of Wait. yeah that's it i can change the magnitude because i can make this thing heavier lighter whatever usually not during the flight we're going to consume a little bit of fuel but unless i'm throwing passengers out <laughs> right i'm probably not going to change my weight significantly uh or rapidly at least so lift the part of lift that you're interested in is that lift vector which is opposite weight and here's where we start getting, again, your novice instructor, is, well, lift is always opposite weight. Uh, the part that we're interested in, yes. But there could be a part of lift, a component of lift, that's working along the drag vector, right? That's kind of creating a little bit of drag here. Now, thrust, I can change that just a little bit. And, of course, I change with the different pitch uh, attitudes of the airplane. Some of it is based on which, which side of the propeller I'm talking about. Propeller-driven airplanes, uh, of course, have a wealth of turning forces that we have to get into and talk about and discuss. But thrust, the part that I'm concerned about on thrust is the part that's 90 degrees to this weight vector. Again, everything follows that direction. Towards the center of the Earth, 90 degrees off that, that's the thrust we're talking about there. Okay? Drag is opposite that weight. Again, degrees off of thrust, or off of weight, excuse me. That is also thrust required. So think about that for a moment. Because thrust required indicates that I may need a certain amount of thrust to overcome that drag. This becomes tremendously important when I remove this from the equation, when I move this 
thrust idea completely. In other words, I have a power plant failure. Now I need some sort of thrust required. Well, where am I going to get that? Well, maybe I have some potential energy that I can convert into kinetic. Okay? Maybe I have something where I can overcome some of this drag. Just park that one for a second because we'll talk about the two different types of drag that exist and their relationship as a function of speed and it becomes very, very important at that time. Okay, so we're talking four forces of flight. What usually a lot of times they go boom, 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 you know what they are? Yeah, click by, right? Eek, some details, 90 degrees and which one can't we change? Okay. <clears throat> Equilibrium. Uh, this one... <laughs> This one will get me because I, I hear pilots talking that the airplane is in equilibrium when all four forces are equal. Great. So you just let me know when we have 2,200 pounds of thrust coming off of one of these Skyhawks because I want to know. If you're telling me that all four forces have to be equal, well, how much does it weigh? close to 2,200, right? Am I right or wrong? I hope I'm right. Wait a minute. I, did I lose you guys again? <laughs> How much does that airplane weigh? The airplane that we're going to fly out there. I just want to make sure they understand what you're talking about. You understand what you're talking about? I'll explain in Russian. A lot of pilots, mm. they think that equilibrium, it means when all four forces are equal. Which is wrong, because there are ну, то есть он просто показывает пример, что это bullshit, как бы, да, и на самом деле под эквилибром понимается вот то, что внизу написано. Lift equal, lift equal weight and thrust equal drag, but not all four forces. Нет, тебя толкнет. Yeah, if you give this answer to your examiner, it's kind of... They, yeah, they might, they might entertain the idea because they've probably heard it so many times over the last years that all four forces, some of these things, they're not going to start the, you don't start the fight with the examiner. Well, we've already talked about that. You don't start with, but sometimes they, won't, they aren't going to start the fight either. Let me give you guys a, 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 good, a, a good book to read. This one, one of my favorites. Does that mean I fail? This is written by one of the examiners here. Okay, it's filled with pages of stupid answers that pilots have given him during their check rides. Okay, I took a lot of my exams with this guy. Well, he's not going to, and he tells you in here, he's definitely not going to fail someone over saying something like this. You know that that happens. They probably understand the concept. But if you're thinking, and I'll tell you, the airplane that we fly, it does weigh 2,200 pounds, right? About 2,000 pounds. If there's any chance in the world of me getting 2,000 pounds of thrust out of that little bitty propeller, come on, man, it's impossible. So it's just the two. Whichever two are opposite from each other, that's equilibrium. Now, this becomes important because, and I'm excited because you guys are pretty good with vectors and acceleration. I think probably Newton's second law is in there. We're okay talking about force equals mass times acceleration. Let's think for a second. When do I have unaccelerated flight? The answer is not just straight and level, but that's the answer that's given a lot of times. I have unaccelerated flight and straight and level. Well, straight and level flight is unaccelerated flight, but I could have unaccelerated flight in other times when I'm not straight and level. Now straight, I'll agree with you on that argument. If I'm turning, I'm accelerating. Accelerating by the change of direction. We've already looked at that in the magnetic compass turns and the dip errors. But if I'm descending at a constant rate, I am unaccelerated. And everybody's mind is blown. Why? Well, think about this. I'm changing my altitude at a constant rate. I'm descending at a constant rate. So that means I'm moving towards the earth, let's say, 1,000 feet per minute. Okay? 
am I also moving in that direction? If I'm in an airplane, I am. If I'm in the air anyways, which I'm descending, so I guess I'm in the air. So I'm moving in that direction at whatever airspeed we're at, 120. And I like 120, there's a reason why. If I'm moving my airplane in that direction, I'm at 120. I'm also moving down at 1,000 feet per minute. Constant speed, constant rate of descent. You are, my friends, unaccelerated. The only time when I'm not unaccelerated, remember the definition of acceleration, the time rate of change of speed. Or we're going to be technical about time rate of change of velocity. And that introduces the turn thing. So if I am changing my speed, now I'm accelerating or decelerating. Okay? All right. On to some bigger and better things. We got Bernoulli's principle. Anybody heard of him? Of course we have. We talked about this person just for a moment and just mentioned him on the Venturi, on the uh, carburetor. So if you take a fluid, this guy Bernoulli studied something and said if we take a fluid and you decrease the volume, the cylinder volume of this fluid. So take the cross section of this cylinder, that volume is less than that volume. If you decrease the volume, then you get higher speed and you get lower pressure. A very, very, very simple way of remembering this is if I had a crowded auditorium and an exit and I shouted fire, everybody would move this direction rapidly, but when they got here, it would be very difficult for them to move, right? Well, it would create more pressure. Take for a moment away the idea that we're talking about human beings who aren't going to bump into each other naturally and freely and all that and make it just a fluid. That fluid can increase velocity and have a lower pressure as a result. We can't make our bodies have lower pressure, <laughs> right? But the same concept applies. So higher pressure, lower speed, same thing on the opposite direction. In the middle, you got the higher speed with the lower pressure. A couple of things here that are going to affect the airplane. One thing is pressure exerted by the faster moving air. Now there is also, for every force, in Newton's first law, every force is an equal and opposite reaction. Every action is an equal and opposite reaction. So some of the air that's coming over the top cambered surface will move downwards causing an equal and opposite reaction. You got two reasons why this, air, why this airplane is causing lift, or this airfoil is making lift. Some of that pressure exerted by faster moving air will cause lift. And some pressure is exerted by slower moving air. Okay? Without getting too far into stagnation point and uh, cambered surfaces and everything else, I know, and please, this does not imply that some sort of air needs to connect back here again at the opposite side at the same point. That doesn't happen. But there is a stagnation point at the very, very leading edge where velocity effectively goes to zero. There's a boundary layer, and in, in laminate air, in other words, air that's coming over here very smoothly, there is a much larger surface by which this airfoil has lower pressure and this airfoil has higher pressure. Okay? And that will help cause the airplane make lift. Or the airfoil create thrust. An example of a propeller, or a rotor blade, or a, a, a turbine section, either way. A couple of things we need to know about the airfoil. Leading edge, the very front of the airfoil. Not saying wing, not saying propeller. Horizontal stabilizer, vertical stabilizer, none of that. This is an airfoil, could include all of those. So you've got a leading edge, you've got a trailing edge, and a line between the two. That line between the two, that is your cord line. All right? Very important idea. Something I can't touch, though. It's not there. It's an idea. The upper cambered surface is the curved surface on the top, cambered, kind of in meaning curved, okay, and the lower cambered surface across the bottom. Halfway between those two surfaces 
is your mean camber line. That just means average. Probably not a great diagram here, but not the chord. It's just halfway in between the two. Okay? When you start talking mean aerodynamic chord and all these other things, uh, we do have we do have room for those lessons, but just outside the scope of this course. For well, your weight and balance, you'll talk stations and, and aft of datum points, that's it. What's my fuselage station aft of, aft of a data point? But just know that some weight and balance calculations will occur with the relationship of your chord lines, okay? Okay, speaking of chord line and back kind of into our realm, we need to discuss the relative wind and the angle it makes with the chord line. Okay. <sighs> relative wind. If I say relative wind, I know you gentlemen know 100%. You might know. Are we familiar with relative wind at all? I know, I know, I know. You're good. Yeah. Relative wind? Okay. Fantastic. So, how does a 14 knot crosswind affect the relative wind of the airplane? It's about angle attack, no? Well, I'm just getting a, uh, I'm getting a, uh, just kind of gauging or measuring our understanding of relative wind because relative wind is really important but I would I would guess I would I would be surprised if as many pilots that think they know what relative wind really know what relative wind is that makes sense so he here's what I'm saying we're flying an airplane 14 knot crosswind I didn't say we're taking off landing nothing else we could be in cruise flight it could be descending. It could be whatever in the world. I don't know. 14 knot crosswind. What effect does a 14 knot crosswind have on your relative wind? What's that? There's no. If anything, it's negligible. And anything, there is nothing at all that will affect my relative wind. That's exactly correct. But sorry, can you repeat? There's none. It will have no effect. Um. So relative wind, this escapes a lot of pilots. And, and, and I tell you, it's again, these basics, the basics that get skipped over, the basics after all these many years of me talking about relative wind. And does everybody know what that means? <laughs> yeah, of course. I know. I, I, I said the exact same thing. And then, and then I started studying into this thing. I realized how much I didn't even know about it, okay? So it's fine. But that's what we want to try to take a look at. What in the world is relative wind? I got a great example. I'd love to share it with you. And that is, I'm going to go outside on my motorcycle, okay? And I'm going to ride my motorcycle down the road. We have a little bit of wind out here today, right? Fine, fantastic, whatever. I'm riding my motorcycle at 70 miles per hour which is a joke because I really go like 120, 130. <laughs> but I'm riding my motorcycle, okay? What wind do I feel? The wind that's relative to my motion. Yeah. Nothing else. There's not one other thing that matters. Oh my gosh, what tire do you land on? <laughs> I know, when you come to land, of course, now we're introducing something completely different. But relative wind is wind that's only relative to my motion. So I have to take a look, what, what is of interest here? And that is only the, the wind that's relative to the motion of what in this case? Not my motorcycle, but relative to the motion of this airfoil. Well, what's the airfoil? Is it a wing? Well, that's easy, it's relative to the motion of my, my uh, airplane. Is it a propeller? Because now it's relative to the motion of that turning propeller. This gives us our turning forces that we experience. A lot of the P factor, asymmetrical thrust, multi-engines, who knows what you're talking about. But that's what the relative wind is. Wind relative to the motion of this airfoil, okay?
Now, the angle, this alpha, is my angle of attack. And that angle, most pilots, I would agree, know what that is. That's the angle between the relative wind and their cord line. Great, fantastic. If we started talking basic lift equation, you guys would want to kick me out of the room. But there's a little bit of an association, and we'll talk about it on the next slide for a, just a moment. Notice on the diagram, I got a, a, a C there, right? That chord. And then you got a C divided by four. Now it depends a lot on what your uh, angle of attack is, speed, what your uh, CG location is, a couple of things. But roughly speaking, a quarter cord or one fourth of your total cord, that's where the center of pressure is located, somewhere vicinity that. Take a look also. If you look at the large vector here, that large vector is your total lift. And then it breaks into components that go back to that gravity idea. So I got components of this total lift that describe this is my lift opposite weight. This is my lift opposite thrust. So essentially this is adding into the drag vector, okay? And that's the foundation for aerodynamics, just a real skimming overview. Let's take a look what happens as we increase angle of attack. All right, follow with me for a second because on the chart at the bottom, I have coefficient of lift in the vertical scale and it's increasing going up, in other words, as we have data points that plot upward on the vertical scale, that's increased lift. Angle of attack in degrees. So as I plot horizontal on the horizontal scale, horizontal and to the right, this is an increase of angle of attack in degrees. Okay? It goes back to a minus four, that's fine. Coefficient of lift drops down to zero. That's just showing when I'm no longer gonna have lift. Certainly I should have some sort of descent here, some, short, some sort of acceleration towards Earth, because I still have weight. So if I have zero lift and still have weight, that's gonna cause an imbalance of those forces. I'm no longer in equilibrium, and acceleration occurs towards the ground. Anytime I'm at one, well, I got some coefficient of lift and depending on what that coefficient goes through a constant and my speed, sure, I may have whatever values exist out there in terms of wing loading, okay? As you increase your angle of attack, so when we continue to increase the angle of attack for this airfoil, propeller, wing, stabilizer, anything, I will get more lift to a point. This point is called your critical angle of attack. Beyond that critical angle of attack, and this is some airfoil, this is not, by any means, this does not imply that that is a Cessna, that's a Piper, that's an Airbus, or anything else. But that critical angle of attack, anytime I exceed that, my lift drops off rapidly. And stall? I stall the airplane. This is the definition of a stall. I have exceeded the critical angle of attack. Okay, a couple of things. Here I can see that the flow is all what's called laminar. That's laminar flow, meaning it's smooth. We've all seen a creek before, right? A flowing river, a creek. You guys got a river right there in Moscow, don't you? I can't wait to see this. I've been seeing it on maps. It'll be frozen when I get there, right? Where is it? Moscow River? Yeah. Moscow. Okay, great. So, is it, I've never seen this thing at all, but are there any times when, during the summertime, of course, not when I go, but are there any times when it's very, very smooth and it's just flowing rapidly? I don't know, I've never been. You guys gotta tell me. I don't know. <laughs> Anybody? What do you think? No? Never. I'm sorry, I'm, maybe I'm not sure uh, I'm some discretion. What about, about what? Okay. Has anyone seen water flow before? Yeah. Okay. Have you seen it flow? After the freezing. 
not after freezing, but anyone ever seen water flowing before, like through a river or a stream? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay. And then have you ever seen it flowing when now all of a sudden I have some rock formation or a drop down and it gets very turbulent? Mm -hmm. So just an example, a terrible example, I suppose, of laminar and turbulent flow. Laminar flow is very, very smooth. This is flow which is, I don't see any wrinkles in it. I don't see any, uh, any uh, white spots, right, in the water if we're talking about water. I don't see any. The white spots, those are the turbulence. Exactly. So here, like, like, like water wipe. very like water, but this is, this is air. So now I have air that's moving over this airfoil. Very, very smooth. That creates good lift. I got great differential pressure. I got plenty of airflow coming off the back, which gives me my action reaction force. Lots of lift provided by this airfoil. If I look here, I probably, I still have some lift, but at the back, there's some disruptance. This is not turbulent flow. Uh, excuse me, this is not laminar flow. This is what's called turbulent flow. Up here, I have laminar flow. You guys agree up at the front? This is still laminar. Laminar meaning very smooth. This is still smooth flowing air. Back here, it's becoming turbulent. And you should be able to feel some of that turbulent air in the airplane. And your instructor should go over this with you as you guys are changing configurations. Right? Extend the flaps and I'll start to feel. There's some turbulent flow back there. Not a lot, we're still flying, but I feel some turbulent flow. There's a little bit of separation occurring. And I don't want to imply that I need to uh, extend flaps to make turbulent flow, I don't need to. But that's just a very nice, calm, relaxed way to introduce the area of discussion, the topic, right? Is just to decrease or to extend those flaps. Now, this turbulent flow, I'll feel it against the airframe. And it also causes separation. Now I don't get my, my downflow and I get reduced differential pressure. So the airplane begins to lose lift. Continuing, and here it's just showing one degree, that flow goes all the way up towards the front. This is the way a wing is designed to stall. We're not going to stall a propeller, okay? We hope we don't stall a compressor, right? We're not going to stall these things, but we'll stall wings. And it's part of our certification process to stall that wing. We're not going to stall a rudder or a vertical stabilizer, horizontal stabilizer. These are not things that we stall. We stall wings. So let's move on to this airfoil and start calling this one a wing. The wing will stall from the tail, the back part, the, the trailing edge. It'll stall from the trailing edge and from the wing root forward and outwards. Okay, think about that for a second. If I had a wing right here, just a model wing right here, and we could look at it. What control surfaces do I have at the wing root? I have some control surfaces there, correct? What control surfaces do I have at the wing root? The inner flaps. The flaps, yep. What control surfaces do I have near the tip? The ailerons. So if this airfoil, if this wing stalls from the trailing edge of the flap first, what do I continue to have control of as we stall? I still have control over the ailerons. Now, it's not encouraged to make uh, aileron inputs during the stall. Because if I use my ailerons. Let's say for instance now I'm flying my airplane and the, uh, the wing starts going down. I want to turn it this direction to bring that wing up. So I got my right wing coming down. I'm going to turn my ailerons in this direction. What have I just done now to the angle of attack at that side wing? On that side where the aileron is. Which aileron goes up? Thumbs up over here means what? The left aileron goes up. So which one goes down? The opposite one. 
So if I make that aileron go down, what have I done with my angle of attack on that side? I've increased the angle of attack. So if that side were close to stalling, stall. now that tip of the wing is also stalled. And even though I was trying to bring that wing up, I'm going to make it much, much worse. The concept is if I'm stalling an airplane, don't use your ailerons. Keep your ailerons neutral. But I could use my rudders. The rudder is still, it's not stalled at all. It still provides plenty of directional control. So use your rudders to help maintain directional control in a stall. Okay. In order to stall an airplane, I'm going to exceed this. What is this called again? Is it, uh, huh? so. Yep. What's it called? Yes, this is uh, uh, crisis, uh, critical. critical. Critical angle. Critical angle of attack. To recover from that stall, what do I do? Decrease, Decrease the angle of attack. Okay. Remember those things. Those are, those are important. Now, somehow or another, I think you know, the aerodynamics got a little funny on us. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, lift, airfoil, pilot controlled lift. That's fine. Weight, thrust, drag. All right, let's go. Add some small comments for people who is flying big airplanes and was graduated from Russia. Universities, as you can see in the, in the FAA theory about about uh, aerodynamics, they don't show and not provide formula. Yeah. Very Basic lift equation. Yes. Yes. So we don't we don't have it in FAA materials, right? We do. Where? I don't. I, I didn't see it. In the Naval Aviator's Guide to Aerodynamics. Exactly, but it's not the point. It's not included in the reading test. It's not included in the check ride. It's That's. It's included during the flight training, but you're right. It's not included I mean, very much, right? We don't have it in the pilot. For example, pilot handbook of aeronautical knowledge. If you just listed the aerodynamic, you will not see this. Yeah. Lift equal to C Y uh, rho V quad uh, rho V doubled blah 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 divided by two multiple square of your speed. Width, right. Yeah. So it's not included in the basic knowledge. Not in the basic. Not in the basic, yeah. In Russia, we usually start from this we start from this. Uh, well, we just, we just really, just, just a difference. It, it, it is how, you know, the, the problem is scope, you know, and how much time can we, can we, uh, how much time can we spend on aerodynamics? Because we still got weather. We still got weight and balance. We, there's a wide variety of things. Um, what I've found more, more often than not is that, that, Pilots grasp just the general ideas of this, but man, basic lift equation, and, and you've got them at the, the edge of outer space. You really do. There's a lot of value in it, especially that speed idea. I don't think I'm changing air density a whole lot along the way, but not in a Cessna, at least speed is a big deal. All right. So flaps, we discussed flaps. Haha, <laughs> one of my favorites. So depending on my, <coughs> my capabilities or my situation, uh, I may not be capable to land with flaps because in this airplane, the flaps are electrically driven, right? I got electric driven flaps. So I got flaps that go down on a motor. Either the motor fails or the electrical system fails, or maybe I have it turned off for some sort of emergency. In that case, I can't use flaps because I can't get the motor to drive the flaps down. Okay. If I have an emergency situation that requires a precautionary landing, a precautionary landing, and we can go to the AFM and we can read all about it in the 172 manual, a precautionary landing tells me to land with 20 degrees flaps. That's also considered an emergency. That's an emergency situation. So I really have no reason to land these airplanes with 20 degrees flaps. I don't have any reason to land them with 30 degrees flaps or 21 or 24 or whatever the case may be. 32, nothing. Full flaps. It tells me I have full flaps. Now in our airplanes, they have 40 degrees flaps. 
A lot of subsequent model Cessnas had only 30 degrees of flaps. I don't know where the mysticism is with 30 degrees to 40, but somehow down the way, pilots became uneasy or less confident in flying airplanes with 40 degrees of flaps. I, I still, that, that is mind boggling to me. Just push the flaps down full when it's time to land, right? That's what it says to do in the AFM. And if I have some sort of consideration about crosswind, well, the maximum demonstrated crosswind was demonstrated with full flaps. You shouldn't be out there in the first place trying to land this thing if you don't think you can land it in the crosswind with full flaps, right? Something happened about, I don't know, I need to use only 10 degrees of flaps when I'm landing because, okay. Anyways, so off my soapbox, what do flaps do? Flaps are high lift devices. The high lift devices allow me to make a steeper descent path. This is a good thing. Without increasing airspeed. Okay? So if I maintain the same airspeed, same airspeed, same airspeed, with flaps, I get a steeper descent angle and still reach the touchdown zone. Here's my touchdown zone. Okay? With less flaps or no flaps, I'm flying a much flatter descent angle and reaching the touchdown zone. Okay. Well, the rule book tells me that I'm supposed to remain on or above the glide path unless required for a safe landing. So I'm not supposed to be down here. I'm supposed to be on that descent path, the normal three degree descent path that we've all done from the beginning and it doesn't require any instruments. It's what I know from looking outside and I can evaluate and see that I'm on a three degree descent path. The same one that we use from day one that you use until day whatever, is it always exactly? No, none of this stuff is exact. It is in the classroom, which makes it convenient for us to show, but we keep our practices and our procedures consistent so that I try to make it the same every single time practically as well, not just in the classroom. The idea is that full flaps allow me to make that steeper descent path with a constant airspeed, without increasing my airspeed. Now, certainly I could do it another way too, and that is my forward slip to land, which I love. Uh, the forward slip to land is a wonderful thing. I don't use flaps for that. It is a requirement for my certificate. I promise you, promise you, promise you, that if somewhere down the way we need to fly together to see if you're ready for your check ride, guarantee yourself that we will do a forward slip to land. Not a big deal, really not. But I can tell you also that I've found more times than not that I asked the pilot to do a forward slip to land and they say, well, I never did that before. Or, yeah, Joe showed me one one day. Okay, that's good. I hope you remember exactly what it looked like because now it's your turn. <laughs> okay, forward slip to land. All right. Now then, let's talk. Let's talk for instance for a little bit about the axis of flight. I've got three axes. A longitudinal axis, which this is going to come into play with which tire do we land on. All right? Here's your longitudinal axis. Just the long from the very tail tip of that airplane all the way to the very, very front of that airplane. That's your longitudinal axis. A vertical axis, which is just straight up and down. All of these axes are exactly 90 degrees from each other. And a lateral axis, okay, from wingtip to wingtip. Great. How do I control the airplane around these axes? Primary flight controls. We got three of these, I got three primary flight controls. Makes it easy for me to remember. Longitudinal axis, rudder. Also known as something I call, student pilots don't know where it is. <laughs> it's also a joke. Okay. Rudder, it's a real thing, it exists, and yeah, you're supposed to use it. Okay. And we don't have yaw damper. <laughs> Such a weird thing, I know. All right, rudder. That's how I can move this thing about the vertical axis, okay? Now then, 
lateral axis. I'm going to use my elevator. Just like an elevator in a building, I make the airplane go up and down. So I can move it around that lateral axis or the pitch moment. Okay? And your ailerons move me around the longitudinal axis or a roll movement, a roll moment. Okay? This one's called yaw or directional control. You've got pitch around the lateral axis and roll around the longitudinal axis. Okay, fine. Let's see here. This is what happens as the airplane begins to generate lift. And it ties in with my induced drag. So as soon as the airplane begins to generate lift, I have induced drag and I have some wingtip vortices. Depending on the size of the airplane and the type of airplane, they could be very, very strong or not really very much at all. Remember when we were talking earlier, we said that I have a, 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 a lower pressure around the top part of that wing. That upper cambered surface creates a longer uh, boundary layer, okay, a much larger boundary layer. And from that larger boundary layer, I get increased velocity, and increased velocity decreased pressure, okay? Underneath the wing, I had higher pressure. So there's some differential pressure here. At the wing tips, the higher pressure would move to the lower pressure and would have nothing to prevent it from getting up there. A long time ago, they began putting winglets on airplanes. This decreased induced drag. It saved, who knows, billions of gallons of jet fuel, I'm sure. But it stopped some of that induced drag. The induced drag still exists. And it exists because of these, well, these wingtip vortices. There's a powerful wake that's created at the wingtips. As you get closer towards the ground, the wingtip vortices are washed out. They strike the ground and they dissipate. So the de that decreases my induced drag. So now I've got an airplane that I'm trying to learn how to fly. And as I get closer to the earth, usually within one wingspan, or in our case, uh, what is this thing? I think 36 feet. Within one wingspan, now, all of a sudden, the airplane becomes more efficient and flies better than it did when it was just 30 feet higher. So I'm trying to land it, and it, it flies more. Okay? This makes it very, very difficult for pilots to learn how to ground fly. Effect, yes. Ground effect. Okay? So as you're getting into your ground effect, remember, those vortices will be blocked by the ground and by the ground effect. Okay. Okay.